Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. Many of you will remember Dan Brown's blockbuster novel, The Da Vinci Code. It was about the presumed bloodline of Jesus. The centerpiece was the presumed marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It caused a firestorm, naturally, because the Bible doesn't talk about Jesus being married anywhere. And of course, church tradition would not be teaching that. But the question was, was it true? Was Dan Brown actually right? Was he on to something? Well, as it turns out, we really can't take a novelist's word as the gospel. Pardon the pun. Let's find out why. Now, what are our sources for this investigation? At Fringe Pop 321, we really try to stick to primary source material. In this case, we of course have the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there are other Gospels, and the Da Vinci Code really got into that subject matter in, of course, novel form. These other Gospels are known as Gnostic Gospels. They're also known to scholars as the Nag Hammadi Gospels. And that's because these ancient Gospels that are not in the New Testament were discovered in 1945 in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Now these other Gospels were written in Coptic and they were in their present form as discovered about a century later than the New Testament. There is some proof that at least one of them, the Gospel of Thomas, probably came from a Greek original that was a little older than that, contemporary roughly, with the New Testament Gospels, which are of course also written in Greek. So these ancient Gnostic sources, again material not found in the New Testament, are pretty close to the era of the New Testament. A little bit later, but still pretty close. Very contemporary, we might say. Now I should point out that the Nag Hammadi material is wider than just these Gospels. We're going to be searching for some texts as we discover what these texts uh, say about Jesus and Mary Magdalene. We're going to be searching in the primary sources and I'm going to actually widen the net. We're not going to just stick with the Nag Hammadi Gnostic text that would rightly be called Gospels. We're going to search through all of the Gnostic material from the ancient world that is known from this corpus, the Nag Hammadi corpus. But let's start our search in the New Testament for was Jesus married or not? You're looking at Logos Bible Software, a tool that allows us to search the original languages of the Bible, but return search results in English. It also allows us to search the Gnostic Gospels, actually all the Gnostic Nag Hammadi texts. Those texts have been digitized for database research like I'm going to show you. Our goal is to discover what the ancient sources, the primary texts, have to say about Jesus being married to Mary Magdalene. Our first search looks for places in the New Testament where the name Jesus occurs along with the noun for marriage, gamos. We can see this happens in three passages. None of them refer to Jesus' own marriage. The second search looks for the name Jesus within ten words of the word marriage in the Nag Hammadi texts. There are no such instances. The third search is nearly identical to the previous one. This time we're looking for the name Jesus within ten words of the word married in the Nag Hammadi texts. Again, there are no such instances. The fourth search is the same as the last two, except this time we're looking for the name Jesus within ten words of the word marry in the Nag Hammadi texts. Once again, there are no such instances. It doesn't appear the Nag Hammadi texts have anything to say about Jesus being married. But maybe we're looking for the wrong term. The next search in the Nag Hammadi texts looks for the name Jesus within ten words of the word wife in those texts. Again, there are no such instances. The pickings are pretty slim. No evidence so far of Jesus being married in the Gnostic Nag Hammadi texts, just like the New Testament. I'll show you one more search. 
This time we're looking for the name Jesus within 10 words of the name Mary in the Nag Hammadi texts. Finally, we get some results. When it comes to the actual Nag Hammadi material, Jesus and Mary occur together in one text two times. Let's look at those. We'll navigate to line 21. It's just, Mary said to Jesus. Nothing about them being married in the context, as we'd expect, based on our earlier searches. The second instance is actually in commentary associated with the Gospel of Philip, the introduction by the editors to that Gnostic text. So we aren't interested in that. You'll notice in the introduction, though, that the Gospel of Philip uses the term Savior for Jesus in connection with Mary. It actually doesn't refer to Jesus as Jesus. So that prompts another search for the word Savior within 10 words of the name Mary. Again, we're not interested in the editor's introduction where the combination occurs four times. We want the translation of the primary sources. Savior and Mary occur within 10 words of each other three times. But that's actually a little misleading. It actually means that either of the words occurs three times in one passage. Let's have a look at that text. We're in the Gospel of Mary now. What we're looking for requires us to scroll down a bit. There we see the three words highlighted. It's an interesting line. Peter said to Mary, quote, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women, unquote. It's not clear what that means since the Nag Hammadi texts never have Jesus and Mary married. We just searched for such a marriage and came up empty. Maybe they were engaged. The typical ancient word for that is betrothed. Here's a search for any form of the word betrothed in the Nag Hammadi texts. Again, no results. But maybe the translators use the word engaged. Let's see if any form of that word shows up in the Nag Hammadi writings. Two times. Note that the other two are in an editor's introductory set of comments. The first hit is in a line, quote, prostitution in which she engaged, unquote. That certainly isn't about Jesus and Mary, since, like the New Testament, the Nag Hammadi texts do not portray Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. The other hit is some comment about engaging in impure practices. So once again, we come up empty. There's no evidence in the New Testament or the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, or that Jesus was married to anyone else. Now you might wonder, if there's no evidence in the New Testament or the Nag Hammadi texts, the Gnostic Gospels, and really all of the Gnostic material that we have from this period, for Jesus and Mary Magdalene being married, why did the Da Vinci Code create such controversy? It's actually something that happens in the novel. Flipping to the middle of the book, again, one of the characters, Teabing, Sir Teabing, points to a passage in Dan Brown's story, and he says, the Gospel of Philip is always a good place to start. That's the end of his quote. What he's doing in the scene is he's exposing Sophie, uh, one of the other main characters, the lead female character, to this notion that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. And so he's gonna quote the Gospel of Philip, and she reads the passage in Dan Brown's book, and it says this, at least as the Dan Brown has it, we have, the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. Now, that means that Dan Brown has one of his characters quoting an ancient text, one of these Gnostic Gospels, that has Jesus kissing Mary on the mouth. Is that text real? We didn't come across it in our earlier searching for evidence that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. Is there such a text? Does it really say that? 
Well, the answer is kind of yes and no. As we saw in our searching, the Nag Hammadi Gospels have been published in English, and they're easy to search in digital form. But for this matter about Jesus kissing Mary on the mouth, we actually need to go beyond English. There's an edition of the original Coptic manuscripts that you know, were the Gnostic Gospels, the Gnostic text from Nag Hammadi, that has also been published. Now, that text, that edition is going to be crucial. If we look in the Coptic edition, we'll discover something shocking. Essentially, that Dan Brown did not tell his readers what was really in the Gospel of Philip. He has a character quoting a passage, but it's not really what's in the passage. Here's the line quoted by Dan Brown's character as it actually appears in the scholarly edition of the original manuscripts. This is the translation in the academic version of these texts. The companion of the, and then there's a gap in the text because there's something missing in the manuscript, is Mary Magdalene. Then there's the partial word of something, another gap. Then the word loved probably goes in there. Her more, so the companion of the blank is Mary Magdalene. Blank loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her blank. Now, the crucial point here is to notice the ellipsis dots. They denote places in the actual Coptic manuscripts, the stuff that we have from antiquity, that are missing in those manuscripts. The phrase that set off such a firestorm isn't even in the manuscript. We don't know where Jesus kissed Mary. There's a hole there. Literally, there's a hole in the manuscript. Additionally, there are footnotes associated with the missing word. I've marked the footnote references in both the English and the Coptic text for you visually. Let's read the footnote. The first thing we learn in the note is that the Coptic word translated kiss can be translated greet instead. And the editors comment that, quote, although kiss may be correct, the Coptic construction found here is not normally used in this sense, unquote. Now keep in mind what we're looking at here. The editors of the Gnostic Gospels are not out to diss the Gnostic Gospels. They are defenders of the Gnostic Gospels. They are the ones that wanted to, again, devote their lives academically to bringing these texts to light. They are not trying to cover anything up here in the name of orthodoxy. They're being honest. Although the kiss, you know, the translation kiss may be correct, the Coptic construction here is not normally used in this sense. But there's even more to consider in the footnote. The footnote concludes by suggesting several alternatives for the missing word. On her blank. Remember the Da Vinci Code had on her mouth. Well, there's a hole there literally in the text. The footnote informs us that possibly it could read on her mouth, or it could read on her feet, or on her cheek, or on her forehead. How do we know that? Well, the Coptic words for feet, cheek, or forehead would all actually fit the number of spaces in the original Coptic manuscript. So they are all possibilities because in the ancient world in the first century, and we see this in the New Testament and other texts, when people greet each other, remember the word kiss could be greet, when they greet each other, they might kiss each other on the cheek or on the forehead. We have scenes where Jesus is being kissed on his feet. Since we have that context, and since the Coptic term that could fit in this gap, in this hole, could be any one of these things, that's really where we're at with primary texts. We don't know in any factual way that this Gnostic gospel has Jesus and Mary making out. We just don't know that. We have to supply that. We have to imagine it. We have to insert it in the passage. And that's what Dan Brown did. Now, just by way of a little review, I want this to sink in. This is so dramatically different than what Dan Brown has in the Da Vinci Code, it's worth repeating and summarizing. How do scholars in fact know 
that these other possible renderings are possible and even probable. It's because of cultural context. And again, each of these other options can fit into the manuscript gap. The Gospel of Philip then provides absolutely no confirmation that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married or intimate in any way. But millions of people now believe just that because Dan Brown did not direct his readers to the actual primary source. Now by way of conclusion, it should be pretty obvious. We're trying to focus on primary sources for this question. There is no New Testament evidence that Jesus was ever married. There's no Gnostic Gospel evidence that Jesus was ever married. Now, the truth is, it wouldn't matter if Jesus had been married. There's nothing in the New Testament or really any part of the Bible that would forbid this. It wouldn't alter his status in the New Testament as the Son of God and as the Savior of humankind. It's just that if we're going to be honest, we have to say, there's no evidence for this. And we don't want to just make stuff up. Thanks for watching Fringe Pop 321. Please visit our website for show notes and sources and come back and watch again because what you know may not be so.